Now, dear ones, last time we were in Romans 14, we had learned how the weak Christian was not to judge the strong Christian when they exercise their Christian liberty. Now today, as we proceed in verses 13 through 23, we're going to end the chapter with Paul admonishing the strong Christian not to exercise or flaunt their liberty in such a way that it would cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble. Now, what does it mean to stumble? Well, ultimately, you're going to see today stumbling has to do with falling to perdition, to damnation, eternal judgment. And I know as I say that, some of you are sitting in your seat saying, well, wait a minute, Eric, isn't it true that real believers in Jesus Christ have eternal life and they cannot lose their salvation? Yes. The Bible teaches that very thing. And Paul here is not contradicting that. But remember, God uses means or tools by which he keeps his flock in the fold. He protects his elect. And one of the tools that he uses are the warnings that we have in Scripture. And so the warning here goes out to strong Christians not to flaunt or to exercise their liberty in such a way that it would tempt a weaker brother or sister to violate their conscience. Now, why is it wrong to violate the conscience? Well, we're going to learn two things today. Number one, it's wrong for a weaker Christian to violate their conscience or for any Christian to violate their conscience because God is the heart knower. And because God is omniscient, he looks at the heart and says, even if you thought it was wrong, even if it really isn't, if you think it's wrong, why would you do that? But number two, when Christians violate their conscience, they incur guilt. And this guilt is something that can destroy confidence, leading to some to say, well, you know what, I can't walk the Christian life anyway. I might as well not even bother. And perhaps for some, once they start violating their conscience in one arena, it makes it easy to violate their conscience in others, and they continue down the path of sin and rebellion against God. And so that's why it's so serious today. That's why Paul wants us to know that as strong brothers and sisters who understand our liberties under the new covenant, we certainly have those, but we're not to exercise them if it creates problems for a weaker brother or sister. Now, in verse 13, that's where we're going to begin today. This is a verse that we left off in last time, and it is a transitional verse, and I'll explain why it is. Notice here Paul says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Now, the reason this is a transitional verse is because it bridges two ideas. Notice in black, you have one idea, that is, that those who are weak are not to judge the liberty of those who are strong. And so what you see in verse 13 in black was dedicated or directed towards the weak brother or sister. Why? Because they were prone in judging the stronger in their liberty. That was the focus last time. But now, as we proceed into what is read in verse 13, the focus is on the strong Christian. Why? Because the strong was prone to use their liberty and perhaps cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble. So that's the issue. And that's what we're going to be covering then to the end of the chapter. Now, let me try to unpack for you how this occurred in the context of Rome. How were the strong and weak Christians getting along and what was happening in Rome that Paul would have to write this? Well, here's how I think it happened. Remember in Rome, you had strong Christians, you had weak Christians. Who are the strong? Well, the strong were more than likely Gentile Christians who from the scriptures had a really good understanding of the Christian liberties that they really had, that they could eat all foods, for example. But you had weaker Christians who were more than likely Jewish Christians. And see, they still had some of the scruples from the old covenant and the dietary laws. And so when they saw a strong Christian eating food they thought was sinful, their heart had or their head had yeah, their heart hadn't caught up to their head. And they still think that it's sinful. And so because they partook in it, their conscience was defiled. And as their conscience became defiled, they were tempted to go down the road of, hey, I've sinned already. I can't do this Christian walk. I can't do this. I might as well just go back to Judaism. And I think that that was what was going on in Rome. And so that's why it's so serious. That's why Paul has to say, you strong Christians, you have the liberty, but don't use it in such a way that it harms others. And so that's Paul's point now. In verses 14 through 15, he says, I know, and I'm, oops, you know what? I forgot to mention something. I want to talk about this real quick. 
Notice here in verse 13, does everyone see on the screen, yep, it's red, the, uh, the idea of obstacle and stumbling block. Does everyone see that? Well, the terms, the obstacle, proscoma, and the term for stumbling block, scandalone, I want you to realize that they're really synonymous, okay? And the image I think that Paul is talking about is think of a weak Christian walking their path of salvation. What the strong Christian was doing by exercising their liberty was putting in a stumbling block on the path and causing the weaker brother or sister to stumble off of it. So that's why he's using that terminology, obstacle or stumbling block. It is serious. It really can cause others to stumble off the path of salvation. And so again, that's why we're not to harm others. So that's why Paul says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Now, dear ones, notice in the very beginning here in verse 14, Paul says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus. What does Paul know and what is he convinced of? And why does he say he's convinced in the Lord Jesus? Well, he's convinced because of his relationship in Christ and through revelation that comes from Christ that there is nothing in and of itself that can make you unclean. Now, we have to define what he means by nothing. Let me pull up my pointer. Notice the nothing. I don't think Paul is saying that there is no sin that you could ever perpetrate under the new covenant. There are a lot of sins under the new covenant that if you and I engaged in would certainly make us unclean. We can't murder, we can't steal, we can't cheat on our spouses, etc., etc. But notice in context that nothing has to be defined with food. Notice here on my little pointer here, the food is the issue. Okay, so what Paul is really getting at then is that there's no food that can make you unclean. You really are free to eat all things. Now, I point that out is because, again, notice on the screen in the box the term unclean. The term koinos there literally means common. Okay, and it's rightly rendered unclean. It's sinful. Here's why. You and I as saints, hagios, are those that are set apart. Well, if you're unclean, you're profane. You're not set apart. And so I want you to realize that unclean means sinful. So if I were to paraphrase verse 14 so that we all understand what Paul is saying, is Paul is saying that he knows from revelation through Jesus Christ that there's no food that can make you sinful before God. And that's very important. Why? Because in principle, theologically, Paul is agreeing with a strong Christian. Yes, you really do have the liberty to eat all things. But notice then he comes to an exception clause. I'm going to pull up my pointer again. Notice the exception clause happens right here, but. In fact, in the Greek, A, I would like it, I would probably render it except. So I'd render it this way. I know that nothing can make you sinful before God as far as food is concerned, except to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, I want you to let that sit in your craw a little bit. Because as Paul says that, we might be tempted to think, well, wait a minute, is the Apostle Paul teaching some form of postmodern situational ethics where, you know, something is wrong if you think it's wrong and it's right if you think it's right? Well, no. For the Apostle Paul, the Scripture is always the final authority. But the reason it is unsafe for a weaker Christian to violate their conscience, even though it might not be a violation of Scripture, is because when they violate their conscience... The all-knowing heart-knower God sees it. And it also is wrong to violate the conscience because it can do great damage by leading people down the road of saying, well, I violated my conscience in one area. I might as well just keep sinning. I can violate my conscience in other areas. And pretty soon they lose confidence before the Lord. They start challenging whether or not they really have faith and they depart from the faith. That's what I think was going on in Rome, that's the risk. Okay, so that's why it's not safe for someone to violate their conscience. Now, we're going to unpack that further, but notice here in verse 15, Paul gives further explanation why it is that it, it's wrong for us as strong Christians to put a stumbling block in the way of the weaker brothers or sisters. He says, For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Now, here's one thing you have to understand. The hurt that Paul is describing here that comes upon the weaker brother or sister 
is not a mere trivial hurt. It's not a mere annoyance, but it's hurt that can lead to damnation. Now, why do I say that? Well, notice in red, the command goes to every strong Christian, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Does everyone see that in red, the term destroy? The term destroy there, apolumi, is often used in other New Testament passages referring to the eschatological judgment, the judgment that will lead to the eternal lake of fire. In fact, Jesus uses, remember in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear man who can destroy the body, apolumi, but fear him, that's God who can destroy, apolumi, both body and soul in hell. And so what's at stake for the weaker brother or sister is that they would depart from the faith. Now, do true Christians ever depart from the faith? No, but one of the ways that God keeps his flock in the fold is by using these warnings. And I want you to think just how strong this warning really is when Paul says, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Think of it this way. If Christ was willing to sacrifice his own life for the sake of some weaker brother or sister, how much less, or I should say it maybe this way, how much more should you and I be willing to do what's so much less that is easier by simply sacrificing one of the liberties that we have temporarily when we're around that weaker brother and sister? So this is designed, I think, to cut us to the heart. Christ is willing to sacrifice himself. Can't we sacrifice a liberty temporarily for the sake of our brother and sister? I think that's what Paul wants us to see here. Now, we see then in verses 16 through 18 that we're not to allow our liberty to become evil. Paul says, Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now, dear ones, notice the therefore right in the beginning. This is an inference that Paul is drawing. And notice the inference. He says, therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. Dear ones, it really is a good thing that we have this liberty. It's a wonderful thing that you and I aren't bound by all of the Old Testament regulations concerning the food laws. That really is good. You and I can eat bacon till the cow, no, no pun intended, till the cows come home. I know they're different animals, but I'm not much of a farmer. I wouldn't be a good farmer. I don't know my animals actually that well. But we can eat all sorts of foods. But that's not so with those who are weaker in conscience. And so what Paul is saying is don't let what is good for you, this liberty, be used of as an evil. In fact, now notice his explanation in verse 17. He says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Stop there. I know some of you are sitting in your seats saying, wait a minute. Isn't there going to be eating and drinking in the kingdom? Yes. And Paul isn't denying that. In fact, one day when you and I are brought to Jesus Christ, we're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be reclining at the messianic table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and with all the saints, and dining with Christ himself. In fact, Bob read a wrote a wonderful article called Dining with the King. It's my favorite, I think, of all the CICs. And that's hard to say because there's so many good ones. But read that if you haven't read it, Dining with the King. Yes, we're going to be dining. But why does Paul say the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking? What Paul is simply saying is that's not the essential characteristic of the kingdom. That's not what really makes the kingdom the kingdom. After all, don't the pagans have eating and drinking? Yes, they do. So he says that the fundamental characteristics of the kingdom are these things. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so don't get hung up on the liberties of eating and drinking. That's the point. Now, let's look at this righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, of course, has to do that with doing what is right before the Lord. And fundamentally, no one can be righteous before the Lord unless they first believe and have the imputed righteousness of Christ given to us. Outside of Jesus Christ, through faith in him, there's no person that is pleasing in God's sight. But for believers, the thing that we are called to, to live righteously before God, is to love him with our whole being, and to love others as ourself. If you're not loving others as yourself, you're not acting in a kingdom way. You're not acting in a righteous way. In part and parcel to loving others is to look out for their benefit which would mean in this context, perhaps you have to refrain from exercising 
the liberties that you rightly have. Okay, now, this further leads then to peace. If people are self-sacrificing and loving in that way, it leads to peace and joy. And notice Paul says all of this is in the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is in his sphere. When Jesus Christ ascends to make a place for us in the Father's house, he puts us in the care of the third person of the Trinity. And so all of these things characterize the kingdom are in his sphere. That's what Paul is saying. That's what makes up the kingdom. That's the essential characteristics, not the eating and drinking, although there will be that. Now, notice in verse 18, Paul says, For he who in this way serves Christ, in what way? In the way of allowing your liberty to be laid aside for the sake of a weaker brother or sister. And if you will act in that way, notice he says it's acceptable to God and approved by men. Now, I think all of us in here would say, yes, if I sacrifice for someone else, certainly that's acceptable to God. But notice Paul says, curiously, it's also approved by men. Now, we might ask ourselves, well, what men? Is he referring to just believers or unbelievers or both? I think it's probably both. Now, I know there's times when you and I who act righteously because of our faith in Jesus Christ are not going to be approved by men. But I think what Paul's getting at is even when Christians before pagans demonstrate a sacrificial love for one another, that's even winsome to them. Even the pagans have to admit there's something commendable about this Christian sacrificing for another. I think it's much like what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount where he said, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what Paul is saying. That's how we should be willing to sacrifice for one another. Okay, now, as we continue then in verses 19 through 21, we are to pursue peace with believers Paul says, so then we pursue the things which make for peace in the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Now, dear ones, notice in the beginning in verse 21, we have another inference that Paul is drawing. So then... So then, notice he says, we pursue the things which make for peace in the building up, or the, literally the edification of one another. Now, what this means is that you and I certainly have liberties. We have all sorts of liberties under the new covenant that we did under the old, but if we use them in a way in which they detract from peace within the congregation, or it detracts from the edification of another believer, they're to be refrained from That's the idea. In fact, notice in verse 20, he says, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. Now, I want you to think about these Roman Christians who were strong. They had their theology right. They knew, for example, from Mark 7, 19, that Jesus had declared all foods clean, and Paul agrees with them in principle. But if they use it in such a way that it harms a weaker one, then what they've done is evil. And that's why I think verse 20 and 21 are really devoted to the strong Christian. In fact, notice when he says, all things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. That's directed not towards the weak, but the strong. Okay, in other words, if you are giving offense to a weaker brother or sister, you're sinning against the Lord. And in fact, in verse 21, here I think Paul is giving a summary. This is the summary statement that he's giving to the strong believer who understands their liberty, he says, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. That's the summary statement for the strong believer. All right, now, let me give you a few caveats to this. I don't think this means, I don't think Paul is saying that we as strong Christians can't teach, exhort, and help a weaker Christian better understand the liberties that they truly have by teaching them the scriptures. I don't think he's prohibiting that, okay, as long as we're doing it in a loving way, not just trying to beat him up, uh, you know, alongside the head with truth, right? Second thing, this does not mean the entire body of Christ is always at the whim and mercy of the weakest believer. And I say that because sometimes the issue isn't a weaker believer, but a, a person who isn't a believer at all. You'll have sometimes people will add to the gospel where if you don't have their scruples, you don't have righteousness before Christ. Remember, that's where Paul puts his foot down. 
When the party of the circumcision came to Galatia, Paul didn't say, well, we have to acquiesce to their scruples. No, he put his foot down and said, no, you have justification and right standing before God through faith alone, in Christ alone, all by his grace alone. But when somebody really has that same viewpoint, they're saved, but they think certain things are sinful that really aren't sinful, they have to be protected. That's what Paul's driving at. Okay, now, let's continue on for the sake of time. Notice here when we come to verses 22 through 23, Paul's going to talk about not violating your conscience. In verse 23, he's going to be referring to the weaker brother or sister. But in verse 22, he takes another direct shot at the stronger. Notice what he says. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Okay, so again, in verse 22, I think Paul is again admonishing the stronger Christian. Notice he says there, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Again, I don't think he's saying that we can't instruct another weaker brother or sister from the scripture. But you know, and I'm sure it happened in Rome, that there are strong Christians who will flaunt their liberty deliberately in front of the weaker with scruples, not to help or to edify, but simply to show the liberties that they have. Paul's saying you don't do that. This is conviction that you're to have before God. Now, in fact, notice where it says happy. Does everyone see? I like being happy. Everyone does. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. The term happy, literally, makarios, is blessed. Blessed is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. How could you condemn yourself in the liberty that you really have under the new covenant? Well, the way you would condemn yourself, think about how strong that language is, is if you exercise the liberty that you really have in such a way, in such a callous way, that it causes a weaker brother or sister to stumble. In fact, the Apostle Paul is teaching the same thing that the Lord Jesus taught. Remember in Mark 9, 42, Jesus said, if you cause one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and you'd be thrown into the deepest part of the sea. So that's how bad it is. By the way, let me define Mark 9, 42 for you. When Jesus says one of these little ones, a little one isn't simply a child. Sometimes people will say, well, you have to have a childlike faith. Well, the implication of a little one, a micros, is one who has no status in the eyes of the world. I say that because in the ancient Near East, if you had no status, you were a little one. Children had no status. And so if you became a follower of Jesus Christ in the eyes of the world, you were a little one. You had no status. And so When Jesus says that in Mark 9, 42, he's saying, if you cause any believer to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and you'd be drowned in the sea. That's how condemnable it is to cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble. Why? Because salvation is at stake. Very, very powerful words. Okay, now, in verse 23, I think Paul switches here to really address for a final time in verse 14, the weaker Christian. Now, here's why. Let me pull up my pointer again. Notice in verse 23, he says, but he who doubts, literally the one who wavers. Well, the one who wavers is the one whose conscience hasn't been adequately informed through knowledge of scripture as to the liberties they really have. So this is certainly a reference, I think, to the weaker brother or sister. And notice what Paul says about them or to them. He says, he who wavers or doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, this is a very difficult passage, and I want to define what he means by this. Let's first of all talk about what faith is. First of all, in context, I think faith here has to do with one's conscience stemming from one's faith in Jesus Christ. So the conscience is that which tells us what is right and wrong, but it's to be informed by our faith in Jesus Christ. And so the question then is, well, why would it be sinful to violate your conscience if you're not violating Scripture? Again, let me lay out two principles why, and I'll lay this out further in our application. First of all, the reason why I think it's wrong for a Christian to violate their conscience is because you and I serve 
the God who is the heart knower. And in his omniscience, he sees the Christian who says, I think it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I think he says, hey, if you thought it was wrong, and he knows your heart, why would you do it? Why would you do that which is sinful or you thought was to be sinful against me? But the second reason is when a Christian violates their conscience, it destroys the confidence that they have before God. Why? Because they think they're sinning. And if they think they're sinning, they have guilt. And if they have guilt, they may be tempted, as I think many Jewish Christians were, to say, I can't do this Christian thing. I'm going back to Judaism. That was the risk. And the risk is that the weaker brother or sister would shrink back from the faith all because a stronger brother or sister was callously using the liberties that they rightly have. Those are the risks, I think, that are at play here in Romans 14. Okay, so with that, let's come to our applications. I have two for you here this morning. Number one, we must understand why violating one's conscience is indeed sinful before God. Number two, we must take seriously the call to protect the faith of our fellow brothers and sisters by refraining from putting stumbling blocks in their path. I want to show you, again, just how serious this is. This isn't a trivial matter. And I say that because I know that this congregation, by and large, is filled with strong Christians who really know from the Scriptures the liberties that you have. Okay, and so this is something that I think behooves us truly learn. Okay, so let's begin with number one. Why is violating the conscience wrong? Again, two reasons. First of all, when a Christian sins, they incur guilt. When they incur guilt, it destroys their confidence. And perhaps some who are weak, they toss up their hands and say, I can't do this Christian thing. That's the first reason. We'll come back to that. But the second reason is when a Christian violates their conscience, remember, what is the conscience? Well, it's that inner referee within the person that determines what is right and what is wrong. And when they violate their conscience, I'm going to show you from Scripture that God, who is the heart knower, sees it. And so look at the bullet points on the screen. God is the heart knower. Now I say that because remember in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says that the heart is deceitfully wicked, is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? And that rhetorical question demands the answer. No one can understand it except God. In fact, that's what he says in Jeremiah 17, 10. Explicitly, God alone is the heart knower. But if God knows the heart, what we can concur or deduce is that it is therefore unsafe to violate our conscience. Remember, conscience or heart, is, they're really synonymous. It's the center of one's thought life. And in that would be knowing the difference between right and wrong. Okay, so I want to show you evidence from Scripture that indeed God will judge us regarding the motives of our heart. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Now, as you're turning to 1 Corinthians 4, remember the issue. Paul is dealing with Corinthians who are passing judgment upon him. They were examining Paul, and what Paul is saying, I don't care if I'm examined by you, I'm paraphrasing, he says, I don't even examine myself. He's going to wait for the Lord to come who actually knows what the heart is. So listen to what he says, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, he says, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. So notice Christ is going to judge even the motives of the heart. And I think this is why it is unsafe for the weaker Christian to violate their conscience. If they think it's wrong, Christ judges even the motivation. Okay, so we don't want to tempt through using our liberty a person to incur that kind of judgment, to have bad motives. All right, now, let me show you some further evidence of this. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 all the way through chapter 10 are very much synonymous with what Paul is saying in Romans 14. So I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 8, 4. And as you turn just four chapters ahead, the reason I'm having you turn there is in 1 Corinthians 8, we see a very similar theme come up that we read about today in Romans 14. In Corinth, though, what you have to realize is Paul is dealing with a congregation that was boasting in being spiritual. 
They were hyper-spiritual, and one of the things that they thought they had because they were so spiritual was gnosis. They boasted in having knowledge, and they boasted that they had the knowledge to know that an idol was nothing, that there was only one God that was the true God, and they're right, and that they could eat all things. That was all part of their knowledge. But again, one of the things that happens is they end up using their knowledge to call weaker ones who didn't have that knowledge to stumble. Okay, so it's the same issue. So notice what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. He says, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know. Stop there. Paul is again agreeing in principle, theologically, with the strong Christian who understands the liberties that they have, who understands that there's no such thing as an idol, that there's only one true God, that you can eat all things. But notice he goes on, he says that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there's no God but one. He agrees with them. But just three verses later, notice on the screen in verse 7, very much like what we saw in Romans 14, Paul says, however, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So here again, Paul is having to go and say, yes, I agree with you strong Christians, you really have that liberty, but if you use it to cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble by violating their conscience... It's an evil thing. Now, one thing I want to point out, notice here on the screen in verse 7, notice there's a relationship, I think, between knowledge and conscience. Think of it this way. The strong Christian has conscience that is informed by true knowledge that comes from Scripture, and therefore they rightly know the liberties they have. The weaker Christian does not have their conscience fully informed by knowledge from the Scriptures. That's why they're considered the weaker brother or sister. But notice still in this text, in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 8, if they violate their conscience, notice they're defiled. Does everyone see that in red? The term in red there, defiled, moluno, in Greek literally means to be ceremonially unclean, but in context it has to do with being sinful before the Lord. So if they violate their conscience, the conviction that they have, they really are sinning before the Lord. And so you see, this makes sense then why Paul said in Romans 14, 23, that who, he who doubts is condemned when he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is what? It's sin. Yes, the faith that they have, that it means their conviction and their conscience must be followed. And if it's not, they're sinning before the Lord. So that's the case I think that we can make. Again, that the conscience if violated, really a sin before the Lord. So let's make sure, though, the Scripture is always the final authority, okay? One's conscience isn't, but a conscience is binding on the weaker Christian because if they violate it, they are indeed sinning against the Lord. Now, let me show you further evidence of this. I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll put it up on the screen. I'll put up 1 Corinthians 10, 28 through 29, but before I put it up, what's interesting in context, Paul is talking to Corinthian Christians who have the liberty to eat all things. And he says, if someone puts, I'm paraphrasing, a steak on your plate, eat it. But don't ask any questions. Just eat it. You have the liberty to do so. You can eat all things. You really have it. But notice his caveat, verse 28 through 29. He says, but if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake, I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's. Then he goes into a different issue for why is my freedom judged by another con- another's conscience? So notice, why does Paul say in this instance you should not eat of that food? Well, he says it's for the conscience, but it's not your own conscience as the strong Christian, but it would be for the weaker brother or sister. Notice he says, not your own conscience, but the other man's. So again, Paul... in. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, he was always looking after the weaker brother or sister's conscience. So should we. So should we. Let me tell you a story where I was a little callous myself. Many years ago, I think this may have been the late 90s, I was, me and my wife were core group leaders at a community Bible study. 
And at a community Bible study, many of you know you'll have a lecture, but you also have small groups where you go over lessons. Well, my wife and I would facilitate those lessons. And so once a year, per CBS requirements, you'd have a party. And we had ours at an Italian restaurant. And because my wife and I were the first there, we decided to get some appetizers and we get everything set up for the people who were coming. Well, we ordered a bottle of wine thinking, well, that goes really good with Italian food. And we have liberty, to, by the way, to drink the wine. Ephesians 5.18 says not to drink wine, but it says do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So the prohibition under the new covenant isn't that you can't drink wine, but it's that you can't be drunk. Well, we ordered a bottle of wine. We thought, okay, we're all set up. Well, the first people that showed up, right away there was a gal said, you know what, can you please get rid of that alcohol? She goes, I have an addiction to that. And we felt terrible. Here we were so callous, not thinking that perhaps someone would have an addiction. Now, again, I'm comparing apples to oranges a little bit because wine isn't prohibited, and we're not talking about the dietary food laws of the Old Testament. So this woman in our Bible study, she knew the Christian liberty. She knew that people had the right to drink alcohol. But for her, physiologically, it was a stumbling block. And I say that because I remember coming out of there saying, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that because I really could have tempted another brother or sister, in this case a sister, to stumble. So here's what I want you to think about as you go out the door today. Are there any liberties that you rightly have that you as a strong Christian know about under the new covenant that you're using that may be causing a weaker brother or sister to stumble? Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a friend, coworker, whatever it may be. But today is to learn like I did and gulp a little bit and say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to be very cautious as I exercise some liberties that I know can be a problem for others. Why? Because we want to protect the conscience of our weaker brothers and sisters. Okay, so with that, let's turn to our final point then. I already said one of the reasons why it's not safe to violate your conscience is because God is the heart knower. He sees even the mode of your conscience or your heart. Okay, but the second reason it is not safe to violate the conscience and the reason we don't want to cause others to stumble is because when a brother or sister perceives that they've sinned by violating their conscience, they incur guilt. And one of the things that we see in the New Testament is that when people incur guilt, it destroys their confidence before the Lord. It often leads to many other sins in their life or a departure even from the faith. That's the risk. Now, again, true believers will not depart. Now, one of the themes that I want you to see in the New Testament is the importance of having confidence before the Lord. Every single Christian can have confidence through faith in Jesus Christ that your sins, past, present, and future are done away. But the one thing that destroys this confidence is when a Christian starts violating their conscience, this guilt starts weighing on them, and they start asking, do I really have saving faith? Now, I want to show you the importance of having confidence before God, and therefore another reason we don't want to cause weaker brothers or sisters to stumble. Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Please turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 6. I'm going to lead you through some passages that talk about the importance of confidence. Now, again, confidence is through faith in Jesus Christ, and we really can have confidence before the Lord. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. Notice here the writer of Hebrews says, But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, that's believers, if, now here's the conditional statement, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Notice how important having confidence is before the Lord. Nothing destroys confidence like when a Christian is tempted to violate their conscience. Uh, fast forward one chapter, Hebrews 4.16. Just flip a page probably. Hebrews 4.16. This is a passage that Bob and I often cite. It's one of the means of grace. Every Christian has the right to go to the throne of grace because we have access through Christ. Hebrews 4.16. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so again, we can have confidence, all of us can, through faith in Christ that, yes, God really hears our prayers. Do you know he doesn't hear the prayers of the pagan? Not every single person is a child of God. Yes, every person is made in the image of God, 
But only those who come to God by faith in Jesus Christ are children of God, sons and daughters, and have the right to come to the throne of grace. But we can go to that throne of grace with confidence. What destroys that confidence? Guilt. When you're guilty, you say, you know what, maybe I don't really have saving faith. Maybe God won't really listen to me because maybe I really don't belong to him. That's the kind of damage that can happen to a weaker Christian when they violate their conscience. Turn ahead six chapters to Hebrews 10.35. Hebrews 10.35. I'll just do a little perusal. I'll give you one more after this one, and then we'll, we'll close it out. Hebrews 10.35. Notice here the command, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Don't throw away your confidence, your confidence before God. What is it that gives us confidence, our faith in Jesus Christ? What does guilt do for the weaker brother or sister? It destroys that confidence. It can lead them to shrinking back. That's another term that we see in Hebrews. In fact, turn your Bible just four verses ahead to Hebrews 10, 39. Listen to the warning. The writer of Hebrews says, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. What does it mean to shrink back? The term shrink back, hupostole, not circusole, hupostole. Say it five times, you own it, you can use it at dinner parties. Hupostole, to shrink back, what does it mean? Well, let me define it from low nida. Here's a Greek, Greek lexicon, and they say it this way, hupostole means to cease doing something of presumed positive value because of adverse circumstances. What kind of adverse circumstances come upon the weak Christian when they violate their conscience? Guilt. That's what would entice them to shrink back. Think about a Jewish Christian in Rome who was enticed to violate their conscience time and time again. They may be enticed to say, you know what, this isn't for me, I'm going back to Judaism. And they would shrink back. Now, that's why these warnings are here in scripture. God always protects his flock. He doesn't lose one of his elect. And one of the ways he protects his elect is by giving these warnings in scripture. Now, let me reiterate what Paul said again, just how important this is to protect the conscience of our brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 12, again, a great parallel to what we read today in Romans 14. Paul says, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, remember they were boasting in that, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idol? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. I tell you, when I read these things, they make me gulp because I'm a Christian who loves the liberties that we have under the new covenant. But notice, if we cause a weaker brother or sister to stumble by callously flaunting and exercising our liberty, we're sinning against Christ himself, the very Christ who said that if you cause one of these little ones, one of these believers in me to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and you'd be thrown into the deepest part of the sea. That's how serious it is. Brothers and sisters, my fellow strong brothers and sisters in here today, I know so many of you have and know the liberties of the new covenant. I pray that you would protect the conscience of a weaker brother and sister. Yes, we can instruct them, we can bring them along, but we're always to do it in a loving and edifying way, not to beat them over the head, not to flaunt in a callous way, because even weaker brothers and sisters were purchased by the shed blood of Christ. That's what I think the Apostle Paul wants us to know today. You have liberty. You can exercise the liberty. Just not what it makes a weaker brother or sister to stumble. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that through your word you give us tools to keep the flock within the fold. We thank you for this admonishment upon so many of us in here who know full well the liberties we have gratefully under the new covenant. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would convict us if there are any people in our lives that we are causing to stumble, that we're tempting to violate their conscience through our actions. Lord, help us to see these things. Help us to be those who are patient and loving 
Help us to come alongside other brothers and sisters and help them understand the glorious nature of the freedoms that you gave us. We thank you, Lord, that you've not saved us unto more bondage, but to liberty. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to protect others, help us to have a heart for others, that we would sacrifice on their behalf. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please stand, if you will, for the benediction. From Jude 24 and 25, Jude says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week.